Welcome. In our last lecture, we began our look at Africa's human history, the longest human history of all. We surveyed the stages in the evolution of the so-called hominid line, culminating in the emergence of Homo sapiens sapiens, our species. We ended by portraying the world of the foraging, hunting, and gathering communities of the late Stone Age. In this lecture, we want to move on to the next major chapter in Africa's history. To understand a very different world, a very different way of life, which largely displaced, replaced, or absorbed the older foraging, hunting, and gathering societies. We're talking today about the revolutionary impact of farms and iron. Now, the domestication of plants and animals, cultivation, pastoralism, agriculture, farming, in other words, may represent the greatest revolution in human history. All over the world, cultivation of crops, the keeping of livestock, led to radical changes in human lifestyles and social organization. Africa is certainly no exception. As scholars continue to debate the origins of domestication. Was there a single place where this happened and it subsequently diffused? Or were there multiple, more or less independent discoveries? Now, the question is complicated somewhat by the fact that crops and animals must constantly be adapted to specific environments, either new environments uh, into which agriculture is being introduced, or environments which are themselves changing. In other words, it's not just the idea, although we should pause and say that the idea is one of the crucial ones in the entire history of, of humankind. The fundamental idea that humans can control, select, manipulate, oversee the genetic recycling of plants and animals for their own benefit is an idea which has had profound implications. But it's not just an idea, or to put it differently, the idea is not enough. You've got to apply and make the idea fit in the environment where you find yourself. You've got to make this crop work in this place, or else you don't get the benefits of agriculture. Now, Despite the difficulties of pinning down, and I say scholars continue to debate the, the questions of, of origins and diffusion, nonetheless, we can locate a number of areas with very old evidence of domestication of plants and animals, uh, very old evidence of agriculture. Certainly Southwest Asia is one, the modern Near East, we, we call it. You know, the Fertile Crescent, Tigris and Euphrates, areas of modern day Iraq, are certainly places with very, very old evidences of of, of agriculture. Moving into nearby Northeast Africa, the Nile Valley, Ethiopia, Highland Ethiopia, may represent one of the earliest, and in fact, some scholars argue, independent domestications and beginnings of agriculture. And another area which is somewhat shocking to think about today is actually the middle of what is today the Sahara Desert. I've said in passing a couple of times that the Sahara Desert, of course, is the world's biggest desert, but it's a very young desert. And that only 6,000 years ago or so, rivers were flowing. This was an area that could support considerable populations. And indeed, there is substantial evidence of at least pastoralism and some say cultivation in places which today can, can support neither of those. Now, so from the perspective of the rest of Africa, for, for most of Africa, in a sense, we can look to the north, we can look to northeast Africa or north central Africa as the places from which the domestication of plants and animals is going to percolate, in a sense, and spread basically southward and westward to, uh, 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 to dominate most of, of the continent. Indeed, over a period of several thousand years, culminating probably in the early second millennium A.D., a bit earlier, I shouldn't say a bit, substantially earlier in West and Central Africa, later in Eastern and Southern Africa, domestication of plants and animals spread and became the basis for livelihood 
again, displacing, replacing, or absorbing hunting and gathering cultures. The exceptions where this, this, this did not occur tended to be the deserts, either new and growing deserts like the Sahara or much older ones like southwestern Africa's Namib and, and Kalagadi deserts, which lack the rainfall to support cultivation and where even pastoralism is very difficult indeed. Now this spread was uneven and let me hasten to add that you don't have to have domestication of plants, cultivation, domestication of animals, pastoralism or livestock keeping, they don't have to go together. It's certainly possible to have one without the other. Some peoples indeed have done this by choice. The Maasai peoples of the, the Rift Valley in East Africa, which we mentioned uh, already at one point, uh, historically were quite dedicated pastoralists. And by the way, the key animals we're talking about here in, in terms of Africa's livestock inventory are the big three, sheep, goats, and above all, cattle. The Maasai were very dedicated to their livestock, again, above all their cattle, and they eschewed, they, they disdained cultivation. They considered that it was beneath them. So they were not participating in both halves, if you like, of the agricultural revolution by choice. Now, in other cases, we find, for instance, people who are cultivating, but not keeping livestock, especially cattle, but it's not usually a matter of choice there. And I, I say that because the benefits that humans can, can take from livestock, especially the supreme domestic beast, the cow, cattle, are so many that, I, I would put it this way, where people can keep cattle, they usually will. Why? Well, again, this is largely common sense, and, and you know many of the reasons. Cattle obviously uh, provide a huge range of, I suppose we'd call them dairy products, you know, milks, yogurts, cheeses, etc. The Maasai, indeed, historically, and in some parts of, of Kenya and Tanzania, this is still the case, subsisted largely on two products of their living animals, milk from the cow's udders and blood drawn from the, the cow's necks, uh, uh, mixed together. So dairy products, again, high in protein and, and, and a, an important source of nutrition in that sense. Uh, when we think of cattle in, in this beef-happy culture, it, it is usually meat that we think of. Of course, that requires the slaughter of the beast. And here I, I do enter a, a note of, of caution here. Obviously, beef was consumed in Africa and has been consumed, is consumed. But historically, it would be consumed by elites. And then I would suggest that ordinary people would do so quite sparingly. You'd be very reluctant to slaughter in order to get the benefits of the beef, precisely because of the other benefits you get from the living animal. So, in village Africa, if I can generalize that much, the times you would f uh, find beef being consumed would, would usually be special occasions, you know, a marriage, a, a funeral, a celebration of, of some sort uh, like that. Now, of course, the, the dead beast, if that is what indeed occurs, provides other things, uh, leather, and, and the, the hides, the horn even can be fashioned into tools or even used decoratively, even musically in some cases. Uh, good to go back to the, to the living beast for a moment. Cattle have a number of other advantages. Again, I, I'm extrapolating from the supreme domestic beast here. For one thing, they move themselves. They don't have to be carried. Uh, you know, so many benefits seem to flow from from the possession of cattle that, you know, some people will go into African communities or have gone in and say, my gosh, they, they, they call it the cattle complex, you know. These people seem to be obsessed with their cattle. All they do is talk about their cattle, you know. And I got to tell you, cattle is extremely important where they can be held. And it's true. Young boys can often name every single, you know, beast in a herd. They can use a single term uh, in, in various languages to to describe, for instance, a color and a pattern of, of beasts that recur, you know, what, something that we would require 10 or 20 words to, to describe, they have one word and they know what that, what that cow looks like. But, you know, as much as cattle have been integrated into this kind of cultural complex and have very social purposes and so forth, I, I must emphasize that it is the bottom line material benefits that they bestow that leads to the, the kind of social ramifications here. You know, uh, Peoples in cattle-keeping areas have sometimes tried to explain to outsiders, people like me, 
you know, the importance of cattle by using a, a, a metaphor that, that I'm more familiar with. And they'll say, well, cattle are our bank. And by that, they mean that this is a measure of wealth. It's a store of wealth. In other words, think of a, a savings account. What do you want to do with it? Basically, you want to leave it alone if you can. You want to leave it alone. You only want to draw it down on a special occasion. And you want to enjoy the interest of it. Now, in the case of cattle, of course, the interest is represented by by calves, by the, the increase um, in the herd. Now, when I say a measure of wealth or cattle or our bank, it's quite typical that people would go, for instance, in Southern Africa to the mines of Johannesburg or, or, or migrate for wages, take those saved wages, return to the rural area, and invest it in cattle as the store, as the converted form and keepable form of that, that wealth. So why would people not keep cattle then? Well, principally, there are some reasons that are physically related to humans. For instance, in some populations in, in parts of West Africa, there's a lactose intolerance, which makes cattle keeping, at least for the, for the dairy product side, um, really not a, not a practical issue. Probably most of all, though, it would be the, the various diseases, which can uh, prevent people from being able to, to have cattle. Above all, tr trypanosomiasis, uh, carried by the tsetse fly. There are fly belts in places like Zambia and Zimbabwe. And as a general rule of thumb, if you're in a fly belt, and you can get maps of these things, you're going to find, and you're going to find it impossible uh, to keep cattle in those regions. And therefore, to prevent the movement of those belts one way or the other becomes a, a real object of communities and governments and so forth, because it takes away these various uh, benefits. Now, where you can have livestock and crops together, and the term I would use for that is mixed farming, okay? You've got a particularly potent combination. Again, these two reinforce each other in some ways. Cattle can be used as draft animals to pull, for instance, agricultural implements used in cultivation. Most <laughs> directly, perhaps, you can obtain fertilizer from cattle in the form of, of manure, one of the oldest forms of increasing the, the fertur for fertility of the soil. So it's a particular mixed farming, a particularly potent combination, and one which has had a, a very large impact indeed in, in many parts of Africa. Now, back to crops for a second here. Um, I mentioned adaptation to environments, and I'm going to toss out some generalizations here related to a couple of those major environments that we, we talked about in the, in the second uh, lecture. In the rainforest areas of Africa, one is likely to find a predominance, not as this an exclusive, but a predominance of what we could call broadly root crops, uh, especially uh, crops like yam or cocoa yam in the, in the West African rainforest. Again, if you read Chenua Achebe's uh, famous novel, Things Fall Apart, uh, the subject of, of yam seems to come up every day. I mean, again, this becomes almost a currency in that, in that culture. There's one point in which the, the hero of that novel, a uh, kind of macho uh, guy, the, 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 uh, the protagonist, uh, is disgusted with his son, whom he considers a, a weakling, and he, he, he mutters in disgust that a, a bowl of pounded yams could probably defeat his, his son in a, in a wrestling match. In any case, if we move out of the rainforest to the savanna, and I emphasize in lecture two that savanna probably has been home to more people, uh, and therefore more people's history than, than any other environment. These, remember, were the Great Plains of, of Africa, and as we might expect, it has been grain crops which have predominated on those plains in those savanna regions, much as they do in the, in the Great Plains of, of North America. The classic African grain crops for much of the continent, I would, I would isolate two in particular. Millets, several varieties of millets, sorghum, several varieties of, of sorghum. Those are the classic, great, historic crops of the African savanna, grain crops of the African savanna. But here we, we kind of get a little foreshadowing of some things coming down, down the road. If you went to many parts of Africa today and ate grain-based dishes, and certainly from East Africa, Kenya, all the way south into South Africa, the staple foods would be uh, a thick porridge, essentially made from uh, grain meal, 
uh, boiled and prepared properly and, and, and again, consumed as the staple food. In, in Kenya, they would call this thick porridge uh, igali. In, in Zambia, it would be called inshima. In, in Zimbabwe, it would be called sadza. But it's essentially the same, the same staple food dish. But the, the grain that's being used, if you go there today and any time, in the last century, certainly, and in some respects even earlier than that, is not millet or sorghum at all. It's maize. It's corn. Now, the reason I say that's a foreshadowing is because, of course, maize, corn, uh, what we call corn, is, is not an old world crop. It's a new world crop. It's a crop first domesticated by Native American, American Indian peoples in, uh, the, uh, in North Central and, and South America. So obviously, maize at some point came from the New World to the Old World. It came from the Americas to Africa. One way to put it is that the introduction of maize, which is now this staple food over a vast part of the continent, is in essence a dietary byproduct of the Atlantic slave trade that we turn to in lectures 13 and 14. There are other American crops, peanuts, for instance. If you go to West Africa, you'll eat a lot of, of uh, delicious stews and so forth, which are prepared with, with uh, sauces made of peanuts or ground nuts, as often called in, in West Africa. Of course, it works the other way. The African yam that uh, Chebby wrote about came into the Americas and into the American South. Not the sweet potato, which is an American thing, but the actual sweeter, lighter yellow colored yam uh, is, is an African crop. I'll mention another. I'm, I'm a child of the South, and I've grown up eating uh, a great deal of okra. And okra, uh, again, is a crop with West African roots, essentially, coming as part of this um, Atlantic exchange that we turn to. And again, a byproduct, in a sense, of, of the, the Atlantic slave trade. Now, in the... Second lecture, I, I also mentioned that Africa's soils, because of the age of the landmass and because of the year-round warmth of the tropical parts, uh, have tended to be exposed, leached, and are relatively poor. And, and again, to recognize that Africans, African communities, successfully adopted agriculture despite these poor soils speaks uh, for itself. Now, on its own, farming would have had a very dramatic impact. But that impact was redoubled by the spread of a second revolution. And that's the revolution of, of iron working. The production of, of iron tools essentially entails two basic processes, smelting and smithing. Iron very normally occurs in nature embedded in other material. It's iron ore. So the first great task, and in fact the most difficult task, is the smelting task, which means separating the, the ore, excuse me, separating the iron from the iron-bearing ore. And the key to that process is heat, very high heat indeed, 1,200 degrees centigrade and up. This is not a, a process of melting the ore, it's creating heat that sets off a chemical reaction and separates the iron from the ore. At that point, the more or less purified iron, in some cases uh, improved to make a, a simple form of steel, can be turned, off, uh, turned over to the, to the blacksmith for the completion of the tool manufacture. Now, iron smelting and smithing is a complex process, particularly the smelting side is, is very complex uh, indeed, and it's very likely that iron was diffused from southwestern Asia originally into northeastern Africa. Again, this means that most of Africa can look north and east towards northeastern Africa, uh, parts of the Nile Valley, etc., for diffusion in, in a whole variety of avenues uh, into to most of the, the continent. Now, the great value of iron um, is that it, it, it rests on, on a paradox. 
It is simultaneously much tougher, it is more durable, it is much harder than the older materials from which people made tools like stone, bone, wood, etc. So much tougher, and yet, when heated, it is far more malleable, it's far more shapeable, so that you can tailor-make this far harder material to the precise and specific task that you hope to perform uh, with it. Paradox, simultaneously tougher and yet more, more malleable. Now, in northwest and central Africa, farming generally preceded iron, and we refer, refer in those areas to the Late Stone Age or Late Stone Age agriculture, in some cases Bronze Age agriculture. In eastern and southern Africa, on the other hand, the Iron Age and the Age of Agriculture tended to spread nearly simultaneously. And this meant that the impact was particularly dramatic in eastern and southern Africa. Some people in regarding the history of, of those regions speak of an Iron Age package encompassing iron, crops, and livestock. Now, as it happened, this also largely coincided with and almost certainly contributed to the rapid spread of a family of closely related languages, Bantu languages. And Bantu, which I introduced today, is certainly one of the key words, I would say, of this whole course. Now, I said Bantu languages, and at base, this is a linguistic term. Bantu is a family of languages, a subfamily of, of a larger family called Niger-Congo languages, uh, and it is indeed a family. There is no single language called Bantu. There are, in fact, 400 to 500 different languages, separate languages, that are related enough, and in fact, they are rather closely related, although linguists rule on whether it's a separate language is basic, uh, you know, mutual intelligibility four or five hundred different languages as part of, of this Bantu family. And they spread from Cameroon, the Congo, Kenya, Uganda in the north, all the way down to Nelson Mandela's people, the Kosa, the southernmost Bantu-speaking people in today's South Africa. Bantu can have a, a wider meaning than linguistic if we start talking about the Bantu world as um, encompassing, again, this Iron Age package, if you will. Uh, I'm going to read you a, a paragraph from John Reeder's uh, book, um, Africa, the Biography of a Continent, in which he tries to sum up uh, these various kinds of changes that we've been talking about and, and characterize this Bantu world. Reader says, the suffusion of Bantu languages and settled farming throughout Sub-Saharan Africa was an event unmatched in world history. Bantu-speaking peoples changed the human landscape of Sub-Saharan Africa dramatically. From a thinly populated region uh, of groups of hunter-gatherers to one that was dominated by farmers living in villages. Their languages spread the word of their innovations, improved food supplies, fuel the dispersal of their influence, and a third factor was responsible for their overwhelming impact, iron. Now, actually, some scholars would criticize Reader for that because he seems to imply here that it was people who migrated, who moved, who were Bantu speakers and carried with them the knowledge of agriculture and iron. And undoubtedly, that did happen in a large number of cases. On the other hand, it's possible that a technique like iron working can spread without the physical movement or migration of people. As we've seen in our own time, it's possible for languages to move and spread without the physical movement of people. So some are critical of assuming the old notion of Bantu migrations and so forth, and I'm sympathetic to that because it gets us a more precise understanding. Nonetheless, at the end of the day, by the time we come to the second millennium uh, AD, most of the, the southern half of the continent has been transformed, has been revolutionized. And the elements of that Bantu package in terms of different peoples speaking different languages, using different kinds of tools, and making their living a different way is in place. So, we can sort of move this to a close then by uh, elaborating a bit on the impact which I, I just uh, alluded to in a sense. What difference did farming and iron make? How did life compare with 
the old hunting and gathering world. And I think maybe the most useful thing to do here is to ask the same set of questions that I asked of the world of, of hunters and gatherers, of the, the foraging world, and which in my mind are good questions to ask about any age, any epoch, any uh, you know, world, uh, et cetera, the industrial age or the digital age or what have you. Basic questions. How did people make their basic livelihood? What were the tools they used and employed, driven by what kinds of energy? What about group mobility? What about group size? What about occupational differentiation and the division of labor? What about stratification in comparing the world of one culture with the world of another? In this case, the agricultural Iron Age world with the old late Stone Age foraging world. Now, we've already answered a couple of these. Obviously, the basic, sense of our basic source of livelihood has, has shifted to agriculture. We've answered the question largely about tools. Obviously, iron tools are going to have a tremendous um, advantage over the older ones used in the late Stone Age world. What about things like mobility, population, and so forth? Now, for obvious reasons, cultivating communities are far more sedentary. They're far more settled in one place. If you have crops in the ground, you've got to stay with them. If you're threatened by natural calamity or human aggression, you can't pick them up and take them with you. So, settled village life, which, which Reeder talked about here, uh, is in a sense a product of these iron and agricultural revolutions. Now, with less need for mobility, populations uh, could grow. Again, the notion of moving large numbers of children, for instance, uh, in, a, in a, a highly mobile community is, is a factor. It's not such a factor if you're in a more sedentary situation. Uh, I would suggest to you that it is in the aftermath of the introduction and spread, the, the institutionalization of agriculture and iron that Africa experiences basically its first population booms, its first population uh, explosions. Now, with a single farming homestead now able to produce a surplus of food, the way was cleared for an enormous elaboration of occupational spe uh, uh, specialization. Again, the key here is a farming household or homestead able to produce more in the way of food than it requires itself for its own uh, survival and so forth. Occupational specialization, the blacksmith, the smelter, are largely not going to produce their own food. Uh, they're going to obtain it from others who do. This gives them, of course, the, the time, in a sense, the space to become experts in their craft. To the smelter and the blacksmith, we can add the builder. The healer, that's an occupational specialist. It's, it's a specialist in, in medicine. We can add the priest. That's a religious specialist. And again, the priest is largely going to obtain his or her uh, food supply from the surplus of, of communities now able to generate that surplus. Now, surplus, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of course, some people specialize in power. And surplus can be siphoned upward to support them. In the aftermath of iron and agriculture, the potential for hierarchy and stratification in these much larger, more complex societies multiplied. Surplus and specialization implied as well the exchange of goods and services. Either locally, you know, this is kind of the birth of, of the village or the regional marketplace or indeed over long distances, and a number of our succeeding lectures are going to show the, the very uh, great antiquity of long distance trading networks uh, in Africa. But the precondition, in a sense, are the revolutions we've been talking about. A commercial revolution was also getting underway. In the end, then, Africa had been transformed. The essentials of the Iron Age are still visible in rural Africa today. And the groundwork for the more specific histories that we investigate in the rest of this course was in place. Thank you.